to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search her as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now, there's a, a great deal there for us, isn't there? So if you were to ask, actually answer this question, what are some of the ways you can improve how you interact with others and biblical teachings or other ideas? Well, we can actually go to this particular proverb and actually apply some of the things we have here, right? Those are really good things for us. So take a look at the verb receive. It means to treasure, incline, apply. So what attitude about wisdom do these verbs actually convey? What do these verbs actually convey? Anybody have any thoughts? Sir? Too early in the morning? <laughs> I know that feeling, you know. <laughs> Okay, it's active. We don't necessarily just sit there and expect it to happen, is what Nancy said. That's a, that's a good, good thing. Well, probably, you know, searching for wisdom is desirable, but it just doesn't come automatically. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're right, Nancy. I think it's true. It doesn't necessarily just come to us automatically. Um, sometimes it's... Um, it's something that we you have to have a, an attitude uh, uh, for. Uh, in verse 17, we can just kind of, kind of throw this into the mix. Why is it important to actually cry out for discernment? Why, why actually cry out for discernment? Because that's what it says in verse 3. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, why, why would that be important? What verse, where are you at in the Bible? So we're at Proverbs chapter 2. We looked at verses 1 through 5, and we're looking at verse 3. And the question is, along with verse 16, is why is it important to cry out for discernment? Anybody? Go ahead. Well, I'm speaking only for myself because okay. I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I need it. It's an interactive thing. It's, if you do, then I'll do. It's an interactive thing. If, all of our help has to come from God. Right. So okay. if we lack knowledge, he can give it to us. Okay. We yeah. are for the Holy Spirit's direction. Okay. Okay, absolutely. Okay, anything else? I think because you're surrounded by so much, many non-Christians that don't follow the Lord, that and they make bad decisions. You know, they don't. They don't care. They don't care. Okay. It's how asking God to help you, how to approach that person, and to bring to mind the right Bible verses. To okay. Share. All right. Those are all. Those are all fine answers. Yep. It, skip. It demonstrates a dependence on God. Okay. Our, our, our understanding and the true intent of his word. It demonstrates a desire to want to be in that condition. Okay. All right. Paul, oh, great. It's an expression of desire. An expression of desire. Okay. May I add something, another reference? Exodus chapter 4. Go ahead. And Moses is having a conversation with God out by a burning bush. And God said, Moses, I want you to go out and read these people. And Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither now nor in time past. I am slow of speech and of tongue. But the Lord said, Who made the mountains? Now go. Who makes anybody able to speak? Or see, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then, go, and I myself will be with your mouth and instruct you in what you are to say. Okay, so Moses looked at himself and saw his deficiencies and inabilities, and he didn't 
you know, he just really didn't rely on God for the things he needed to actually accomplish uh, that God told him. So God doesn't leave us alone. But I'm going to give you something that's really, really simple. Why is it important to cry out for discernment? Because God said so. <laughs> right? That's just exactly what God, God said to do that. You know, and, and your, all your answers are, are exactly right. They're, they're all good answers. But the most simplest one is just simply, if God said to do this, then do this. You know, and so whether we understand it, whether we don't understand why we need to do that, he just simply said, I want you to do this. And, and I think whether it's the humility we need, whether it's dependence we need, whatever attitude we need, it, those are all good things and you've all stated them. They're all ex excellent uh, answers to that. But sometimes the simplest answer is the best answer. And I think in this particular case, if God tells you to cry out, then just cry out because that's what he told you to do. And he also uh, told us that he wants to have fellowship with us, and that's part of fellowship. Okay, that would all be, that would all be true. That's yeah, exactly yeah, right. Exactly right. Okay, let's go on to 18. What do you think it looks like in, in practice to seek wisdom as if it were hidden treasures? To seek wisdom as if it were hidden treasures. Well, typically looking for treasure is something that requires effort. I mean, you gotta, you can't just say, okay, I'm going to go to X uh, or whatever, look at the map and say this is where it is. You need to take the effort to, to go and seek it. So it, it requires effort. Not, you can't just sit back and expect it to come to you. But you need to use your treasure map. <laughs> okay, the treasure map, right here. The uh, phrase right here, um, uh, search for her, ask for hidden treasures. Well, hidden means it's not always uh, obviously right there. Right. You may have to do some digging to get the treasures. Yes. So yes. when uh, the Bible says one thing, there may be more behind that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sometimes not as obvious. And I'm, I'm going to pick on Pat for a second because she. She asked me a question the other day, and, I, and Lisa has something she wants to contribute, so... No, no, no. But, but Pat, Pat asked me an interesting question, and, and I really didn't know how to answer that one, uh, because I was more familiar with the other passage. So she was asking me about, in Titus, the requirements for an elder, and it actually uh, talks about one of the requirements, that your children are believers. So when you look at the Titus passage for the requirements for an elder, it specifically says that your children are believers. Well, in the Timothy passage, it doesn't necessarily say that. It talks about that your household is in order, that you're able to actually do that. So, so when she mentioned that one, I wasn't really sure because I was familiar with the other one. So uh, Lisa and I did a little bit of a word search and, and she, uh, Lisa uh, sh uh, showed me that the word believe is also translated in other places faithful. So this is where, you know, there was something that was a little bit hidden in that particular verse because it wasn't really, when you look about the context and you compare the scripture with the other scripture in Titus about the requirements, it wasn't necessarily saying because she asked a good question in that, well, how can parents make sure or make it their responsibility that they're believers? Well, I can't make my children believe, right? I can't make them. I can lead them, I can show them, I can introduce them, but I can't make them believers. So if it was my responsibility to make them believers, I might never have been an elder. But if I can make them faithful, you know, if I can make them faithful and introduce that to their lives, that's a whole different aspect of what it's really requiring. Lisa, did you have something? Oh, that hidden treasure thing. If I knew there was a treasure buried in my backyard. I'd be out there digging and digging. I always thought of this verse as being fervency. You search for it like you would a hidden treasure. That's how I always looked at that. You know, there's sometimes I, I 
uh, see movies, I, and I, I've always kind of liked movies. I like good stories. I've always liked a good story. And there's a movie uh, years ago that was put out called Holes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody saw it. I don't know if, any, if anybody knows what it is. Uh, but it was kind of a, it was a, a boys camp for yes. bad boys and they went to the camp and they had this really corrupt, you know, a, a lady who was governing the whole thing. And she knew that there was a treasure buried out in this lake that had dried up. And she had these boys just digging holes after hole after hole. I mean, every single day, uh, these troop of boys, you march them out to the middle of this dried up lake, and they're digging holes. So when you look, if you take a, 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 an elevated view of this whole thing, you, you see holes everywhere. This whole thing. Because she wanted that treasure. And she was going to get this treasure. Well, uh, the story turns out, well, one of the boys that were there, actually it was a connection to him so that it was his treasure so she never got the treasure which was really good she was a bad, bad guy but anyways when I think of you know something that's hidden and, and something that treasure and you're seeking it you know this movie always comes to mind because these boys were always out there now they didn't want to but this lady wanted that treasure and she was going to get this treasure and she didn't care what happened to these boys but she wanted this treasure so hole after hole after hole after hole after hole was dug and uh it's, uh, it's even more than your backyard if you had a whole dried lake and you're going to dig up that entire dried lake and you're going to find that treasure. Uh, and she looked for anything that would give them an inkling of where this treasure would be. So if it's a little tube of tooth, uh, you know, a, a little tube of uh, lipstick or a, a coin or anything, and okay, dig further, dig more. And they just dug and dug and dug. And I don't think there's too many people, and I don't think I'm necessarily like that either, but to seek wisdom as hidden treasure is, is sometimes I don't see as much value in it, in it as I think the Lord does. And if we actually can think of it in monetary sense of if we really, if I did say, and it really was true that in your backyard is a hundred gold coins, would you look for it? What would you do to find it? It's kind of an interesting thought. Would you go rent a you know, metal detector? Would you get one of those? Would you actually hire somebody to dig up? Would you would you get would you get a a, a backhoe in to, to dig up your backyard? What would you do? Well, this is something that's really important for us because there are some things that are not necessarily on the surface, just like what Pat saw, what was on the surface wasn't really what we thought it was. There was something hidden underneath that was there, were, there was even more to it. And there's a lot of passages of scripture that are really like that. And I think the Lord really does want us to search. He really does want us to study. He really does want us to look intently for something he has. But it is a treasure. You know, that's the key thing. It really is a treasure. It's hidden. He's not going to hide it from you, but he wants you to look for it. He really does. He wants you to seek it because it's really important and it really is something that's very, very valuable. In our world, only thinks in monetary terms, but Christ thinks in different terms. Gene? I'm just thinking that there are times when I'll be reading, especially in the Old Testament, and I'll, I'll see a passage that reminds me of another passage, and I tie those two together, and then I compare them to what I learn in the New Testament. And what, what I'm saying is that all these things we're told to search out for wisdom, knowledge, peace, patience, they reveal God to us. Yeah, they really do. They're, they're, uh, they're, we've told, we've, we've mentioned this uh, way back several weeks, but the two basic things that the Bible does is reveal God and it reveals the redemption of mankind. So that's, if you need a summary of the Bible, that's what's going on in the Bible. It reveals God, it's redeeming man. So that's what it is. So that's a good, good statement from Gene that 
you know, when you look at the scriptures, you're finding more about God. You're just learning more about him. What is he really like? And so there's certain attributes and just things that you're never going to get unless you actually look at it from that perspective. Uh, so that's a good thing for us to do. So for us, as we, you know, it's sometimes like preaching to the choir type of deal. Here you are. You're in a Bible study. We're looking at the Word of God. But it's those who are not here that you wish you could actually say, I, I really wish that you would really have more of a hunger and thirst for the things of the Lord because it's really going to be a blessing to you. It's going to help your life. It might save your life. It might sway your life. I think you hit on it when you said value. you got to realize the value of the treasure. And it's just not the treasure is for the lost, I believe. As an evangelist wannabe, because I have grandkids now, I want to reach out to them in some appropriate way so they realize my heart's desire is for them to know their Savior. But I, I love the story of Luke chapter 2. The angels appeared to the shepherds because I, I believe God allowed them to come down to heaven <clears throat> because they wanted to talk about the good news of great joy. They said it wasn't, it wasn't just good news, it was great news of joy. That the heavens shook and the angels had to come down and tell the shepherds about it. So they can proclaim it to everybody else. Yeah, it was I hidden think, to many people, right? It was hidden to many people. and I think that's our mission now as, yeah. as disciples of Jesus, is to do the same. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. In verse uh, number 19, what does the fear of the Lord from verse 5 mean to us? Why is that an essential trait to possess a teachable heart? Why is that an essential trait? So verse 5, it says in Proverbs, Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So there's a couple of things there. But why is it essential? Why is it an essential trait to actually fear the fear of the Lord? But it does not mean to be afraid. It means to honor, to accept him, and put him first. Be well, but if you fear the Lord, then you're willing to learn, too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, if you hear people, I mean, I was with a lot of people yesterday that don't follow the Lord, and this woman threatened, her son turned into a girl, and she's a mama bear. If you say anything against my son, I'm going to scratch your eyes. It's like, does it, you don't fear the Lord? It's like, here's my eyes, go ahead, scratch them out. You should, you should be fearing the Lord. It's not what we say, it's what God says. Yeah, there's an element where I, I understand what what um, what's being said as far as honoring the Lord, but there's an aspect of fearing the Lord that He is so great, He is so powerful. I'm a little bit nervous uh, in front of Him. I, I am fearful of Him, and it's not that. I'm fearing that he's going to strike me dead or do whatever, you know, do something harmful to me. But when you're in such majesty, when you're in such holiness, you know, I've never really experienced that. I've, I've never really experienced that kind of glory, honor, majesty, holiness. And so, Everyone that I kind of look at in the Old Testament who's really faced God, what did they, what did they usually do? Oh, yeah, they kind of fall on their face. Was Daniel kind of shaking in his boots when he was talking before the Lord? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, when, there's many, many people in the Old Testament that are quite fearful when they're before the angel of the Lord. You know, it's a, it's kind of a frightening thing. And so I I understand the statement that it's not being afraid, but yet there's a little bit of terror there that I think is reasonable for us to have. And I would take fear to mean just that. Fear. Not not as though we are facing a judge, but 
even my father, when I was a little boy, when I knew I had done something wrong, I was a little bit nervous about that. Don't you think? Now, he's still my father. I know he's not going to kill me. But I knew I was probably in for it. And, you know, that made me fear him. And, and I've always thought there's nothing wrong with a, a child having a healthy fear of their particular dad. I always thought that was a good thing. I didn't think it was a bad thing. Now, if they're afraid of their dad that he's going to beat them up, that's a different thing. Yeah. But as far as having a respect, having a concern that, you know, discipline's going to come my way from this guy, there's a respect, there's a kind of fear that's a healthy fear. We're not talking about the fear of facing the judge of the universe. We're talking about a healthy fear like a child would fear a father who's just um, in that position where you're, you're gonna, you might be in trouble. Yeah, I was just going to say that it's, it's akin to, um, the, as far as the, the parent-child relationship or the father-child relationship, that fear is a healthy fear in that you, it's the same thing with God. You don't want to disappoint your father. You don't want, and you have that fear of disappointing or falling short of the expectations. And that fear can enhance your conduct. It, you know, you let the Holy Spirit work in you and it can put you on a better track to not cause disappointment to either your earthly father or to your heavenly father first. Yep, and, and I'm gonna take this in a little bit different direction. That's absolutely true, absolutely true. But a little bit of fear helped my boys to be teachable. Absolutely. Right? A little bit of fear helped my boys to now pay attention and don't be monkeying around and don't be daydreaming you're going to be learning something, so pay attention, right? And this is lacking in school because there's nothing going on in school to me that's creating any fear for any of these kids. There's no consequences. Right. There's just no consequences, and they're not teachable. You know, the, the, you know, sometimes you just wonder, well, what's going on with the education system? Don't you understand some of the basic things here? Because if you have no consequences, then these children aren't going to be teachable. They're just not teachable. There's no fear in them. And I think there's just a genuine, honest to goodness, healthy kind of fear that helps us to be teachable. Mm -hmm. And I, some of the best teachers, yes, Michelle. I, I see one of the other things too, it's not just the fear of the teacher themselves, it's respect of their fellow classmates. So they they don't feel a community group, they don't feel any respect for, you know, and, and they don't care what the other person's saying next to them, what the teacher's saying, it just, yeah, there's not a community feeling. That's very missing. Right, and that, that kind of healthy fear just really genuinely helps us have a teachable heart. And I think that's what it's talking about here. It's like a father having uh, the respectful <coughs> kind of fear and authority position in place that now enables a child to learn from the father. And the same thing would be true for a teacher. Because a teacher used to wield authority when they get in that classroom, okay? We quiet down and now we're going to not mess around or you're going to be in trouble. You're going to really be in trouble. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. So because that doesn't happen, uh, there's a lot of kids that are just not teachable at all. And it starts from the home and it goes right into the classroom and it goes right into the society. So it's kind of a bad thing that's happened, but to me, the genuine healthy fear of God helps us to have a teachable heart. Okay, number 20. Um, how are you going to put into practice the attitude that are a, encouraged by this particular passage of scripture in Proverbs. So how are you going to put into practice the attitudes that are encouraged by this particular passage of scripture in Proverbs? So let me just read this 
passage again. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry, <laughs> excuse me, cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, <clears throat> if you seek her as silver and search for her uh, for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Great passage, isn't it? You know, because these, these things help us to have teachable hearts. Okay, let's take a look at 6 through 9. For the Lord gives wisdom, for his wisdom uh, from his mouth come uh, knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the path of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. Okay, so what valuable things does the Lord offer? Right? There they are. So if you actually pay attention to 1 through 5, Look what's going to be yours. Right? Look, look what's really going to be yours. Thanks, Steve. These, are, these things are really, really good things for us to actually think. Now, you, you wonder, well, what are some of the hidden treasures? What are some of the treasures? Protection. Yeah, some. You, you do get wisdom. You do get understanding. You do learn what is upright, not down low. Upright. I, as I'm reading through here, I'm reminded of grammatical uh, phrases. If you begin in verse 1, you say, My son, if. Uh, verse 2, so. Verse 3, yea, if. Verse 4, if. Verse 5, then. So we have these ifs, then. And um, then you shall understand the fear of the Lord. Now, and uh, I understand that uh, it, the word for in verse 6 can be also translated because. So if you do these sayings, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord because the Lord is gives wisdom. So it's an encouragement for us to trust in the good things that he wants for us, even though, you know, if we're getting a little bit of chastisement, it's for our own good. Yeah. But there really are benefits. Yes. You know, there really are benefits. They are really eternal, valuable things for us. So as a, sh as a shield, as a guard, uh, getting understanding, possessing wisdom, uh, all these things are very, very, very beneficial to us. And uh, so when you have the kind of heart that actually is uh, developed through a one through five, then you get the benefits of a six through nine. 22, why do those things come only to the person who is teachable? But this is inferred about those who are not teachable. And remember, this goes back to our, our original point. There's good ground, you know, in our parable. There's good ground. And we've, we've kind of used the rabbit trail and got off on this good ground to actually see, well, what, what brings about good ground, good ground? How do we get good ground? And really, we're talking about a kind of ground that has a teachable heart. So when the seed falls on it, it produces 30, 60, 100 fold. Well, how do we get that? And, and how, let's not get the 30-fold. Why, why don't we try to get the 100-fold? How are we going to get the 100-fold here? How are we going to get that much fruit out of this one little seed? We have to have a certain kind of heart. And so we just took off and we're just looking at, well, how do we get this kind of heart that really produces a great deal of the, the things that the God would have it uh, produce? And so you got to have a kind of heart. If you don't have this kind of heart, then you're not going to have, you're not going to be teachable, and you're never going to have the kind of heart that's going to be good. 
good soil. Okay, number three, what is the value and understanding of righteousness and justice? We'll look at our own society. No righteousness, you're not gonna get any justice. And number four, uh, 24, what was the most important thing for you about teachability in our study? Anybody have any thoughts? Anything that was important, learned, uh, thought about, discussed? Anything come to mind? Surface reading means minimal, minimal result. The digging, the more you dig, the deeper you dig, the more you receive, the more wisdom you gain, the more, more God can change your heart. <laughs> okay. Okay, anything else? Guard my heart. Make sure that I am teachable. Yeah, that's a good thing. A teachable heart is really a good, good thing. <clears throat> the whole concept of teachability really, um, really, really struck out to me because then, I mean, I'm willing to learn. I try to be as willing as, as much as I can. But it also helps me relate to other people. Why, 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 why are they not accepting? Why are they not learn? You know, why are they like? Why are they like they are? Not willing to to listen or learn anything. They're just not teachable. Right. Right. And, and that was the whole point of the soil in the parable. Right. Is to get us to a good heart. And the only way you're going to have a good heart is to have a teachable heart so that when the Word of God falls on that kind of heart, it actually produces what God calls it to do, produce. And so, uh, you know, for, for you and I, you know, there's, there's things that we hear all the time. You know, how long have you been going to church and how many Bible studies have you been in? Man, we ought to be golden, right? <laughs> we, we ought to be the best fruit producers anywhere. But you know, sometimes I lack these things and I, you can trace it back usually to a kind of heart. There's a, something not quite right with your heart. Now I can't identify that, that's the Holy Spirit's job. But we can just go over what makes a teachable heart. And there's many, many people that are just simply not teachable. I mean, they can be in church for a long time but their hearts are not teachable. They're just simply not. And they haven't grown. And we want to have the kind of hearts that actually are really fruit producing. And therefore we need to have a kind of heart that is teachable. And you know, and we know that some things that comes across pulpits or in Bible studies, it's not always exactly right all the time. Uh, you're never going to have that all the time. It's not going to be perfect. It comes from a Bible study or a pulpit. It's just not going to happen. But despite that, that's not the issue. That's not the subject. It's your heart. What is, what's the condition of your heart is really what we need to take away from this. So are we really teachable? I mean, can we... Can we learn from what God has to say and say, I need to adopt this into my life? So maybe, maybe the one thing you need to do is cry out. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you, you know, be a crybaby. Mm -hmm. You know, really cry out. You know, this is what I need, Lord. I, I really need to work. I need you to work in my heart so it's in a condition that I actually can produce something here in my life. So that would really be something that would be really, really good for us to take away from a Bible study so that you're just not, right? Going in one ear and out the other. Yes, Gene. Uh, if we come down to uh, verse 11, 